Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112 BK. On the show today, Council Member Jumani Williams to talk Trump, immigration, a recent arrest, and his political future, and remembering legendary investigative journalist Wayne Barrett. Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Jarrett Murphy, filling in for Ashley Ford, who's on vacation. Happy to be here, excited about the show. We're going to be talking about journalism, as we remember legendary Brooklyn-based investigative reporter Wayne Barrett. So I want to take a moment first to talk about our president's attacks on journalism. We heard recently the sentiments of the two Republican senators from Arizona who called him out, noting that, quote, the free press is the despot's enemy. Sadly, even before Trump's attacks, quality journalism has been threatened and shrinking. So how do we fight back? I say subscribe to and support the sources where you get your news. Start local, go national. And donate to the Committee to Protect Journalists and Reporters Committee for the Free Press. For those frustrated with the president or with the state of journalism, those are sure ways we can do our part. Also on the show today, we'll talk to Jumani Williams, who's had a busy week. He announced he's considering a run for lieutenant governor, and he got arrested for civil disobedience. And then I'm going to talk football and what weary Jets and Giants fans can do during the playoff season. But first, these things. Amazon on Thursday announced the finalists for its HQ2, and New York made the list, which includes Brooklyn. Bloomberg News said last year it was New York City's best bet to become the retail giant's second home. What makes the borough attractive? The development boom, of course, and they also cited Brooklyn as, quote, a hip hub for millennials. But of late, Brooklyn hasn't been so hospitable to those millennials, with reports that many 20-somethings have been fleeing the borough because housing costs were too high. Well, a new report says that homes were more affordable last year than in 2016. Sale prices dipped about 4 percent, and median rent has dropped 9 percent since its peak in 2014. But hold the celebration. The borough still has one of the most expensive housing markets in the nation. Last week, Bill de Blasio declared his intention to have the city become an environmental leader when he announced a divestment in fossil fuel companies, as well as a suit against those companies responsible for climate change. Now Governor Cuomo is pushing his own green intentions, saying he would fund a Department of Health panel to look into the prospects of legalizing recreational marijuana in the state. This comes just a couple weeks after the U.S. Justice Department announced that the feds would crack down on states with legal weed. Let the battle begin. And we may still have a big problem with homelessness, but here's one small step forward. Brooklyn will unveil mobile shower stalls and a school bus for homeless people seeking a scrub. Borough President Eric Adams announced it on Wednesday. The two units will come complete with soap, clean towels, and shaving kits. Not to throw cold water on the plan, but the showers on wheels won't hit the streets for another year. We'll be right back with Jumani Williams. We invited our next guest on to talk about politics in 2018, both the local and the national races that are going to be up for grabs in this crazy climate, or that might be a precursor to some candidates' aspirations to higher office. But that was before he announced his own ambitions for higher office and before he got arrested for civil disobedience, protesting the detention of an immigrant rights activist last week. We've got a lot to talk about. Jumani Williams, council member for the 45th District in Brooklyn, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I guess we'll start with, with the arrest. There's video this week of you from last week uh, blocking a, a FDNY ambulance. Why were you there? What was that about? Well, as you mentioned, there was a, a very prominent immigrants' rights leader named Ravi Ragbear, who I met uh, about six years ago or so when uh, he asked me to join him on a hunger strike. Uh, for immigrants' rights, um, he was being detained, and um, unfortunately, they had decided to immediately deport him. But, and uh, those of us who were there don't believe in the immoral, immoral de deportations that seem to be sweeping our city and our state and our country, unfortunately. And so uh, we, we got involved in the Kingian nonviolent civil disobedience to try to stop that. Uh, what I call a van with passengers, because uh, when they came out of Federal Plaza for a good five, six minutes, there were no lights, there were no sirens. That's not an emergency vehicle. That's a van with passengers in it. We had been with Ravi before. We were also in touch with his attorney, so we knew he didn't need emergency medical uh, attention. In fact, 
the district director had told the speaker of the city council, Corey Johnson, that they were going to begin deportation proceedings immediately. And so uh, we believe there was more of a ploy. Uh, he did, he had passed out when he learned he was being detained, but he was all right. And so he was handcuffed in the back, in back of the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to prevent it from, um, and, and a matter of fact, my hope is that every single immoral, immoral deportation results in people involved in civil disobedience preventing it from happening. Unfortunately, I have some questions about what instructions were given to the police, what instructions were given to the strategic response group, uh, if uh, any assistance was given to uh, the federal uh, government, because the response was not the response of uh, people who knew that people were nonviolently protesting a civil disobedience. It was way over the top. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of force was being used. But I really want to understand what happened and why. Uh, the video that most people saw, they don't know, that was probably the third or fourth time that I was, uh, I was violently flung from one side of the street to the other. How do you think you'll get those answers? Are you expecting the, the complaint review board to weigh in, or what's the next step? So I think a lot of people are going to weigh in. I think CCRB is already trying to figure out uh, if we can uh, file with them so they can begin. Uh, the mayor and the police commissioner have said they're going to do internal investigations. I'm not a fan of internal investigations having the final say, but I think they have to play out. Uh, thankfully, the speaker, as I mentioned, uh, Speaker Johnson, the chair of the Public Safety Committee, um, Donovan Richards, the chair of the Oversight Investigation Committee, Richie Torres, have all agreed they also want to do their own oversight hearing. So we plan, looking forward to hearing that. I'm going to present my questions officially to the mayor and the police department, and I'm hoping to get answers. Uh, this immigration debate this week has been locally colored by this incident, but nationally by the ongoing conversation about the president's alleged comments in that meeting, disparaging certain countries, representing the district you do and the people who are there. The shithole comment, do you take that personally? Do people take that personally? How do you feel about that? It should be taken personally. Uh, I always say it's always shocking, not surprising, but we need, to, we need to respond to it with as much veracity every single time. Uh, there was a direct correlation between uh, the president saying he doesn't want people from shithole countries like Haiti, like Africa, like El Salvador, and the brown and black people who are being deported in mass um, Families being broken apart. Robbie's wife is an American citizen. Uh, his daughter is an American citizen. They being Jean Montreval, who was Haitian American, helped create a sanctuary uh, city coalition uh, with Robbie. Was deported from his home. He wasn't even allowed to come in to his normal um, his normal process. Robbie uh, was hiding out in a sanctuary church until then because they, they didn't want to him to be grabbed in the street. But you can't hide what he said versus who's being deported. They're going to 7-Elevens uh, looking for people. This has nothing to do with public safety. This has nothing to do with helping the country. This is about bigotry, racism, xenophobia. I'm proud to represent a district that's probably 80, 90 percent of uh, people uh, from another country, primarily from the Caribbean. Of that, a large majority is Haitian and Haitian Americans. Combined with the 40th district, I have the largest amount of Haitian and uh, people of Haitian descent from uh, Haiti, uh, outside of Haiti. I'm very proud of that. This is very personal to me, one, because I believe in civil rights and I believe in social justice, but this could have been my parents who came here from Grenada uh, who weren't always citizens. This could have been my brother who I learned was undocumented for quite some time. We had no idea. Uh, this could have been any number of my constituents. Lastly, this could be any one of us because they come for some people in the morning and they find a way to come for everybody else at night. You represent that district now. Recent other Jumani Williams news is that you're looking at a potential other office, considering a run for lieutenant governor. Why that office, and where are you in that process of discernment? I'm very excited about having these conversations. Uh, the response has been overwhelmingly positive, even much more uh, immediate uh, positivity than I expected. I think people are clamoring for a different type of uh, elected official uh, to emerge at a higher office. Uh, there was a lot of rumor as I was running for speaker about possible gubernatorial run. Um, I was focused on speaker when that uh, was coming to an end. I, I really started thinking about it more and more. And, you know, a combination of uh, what I want to make sure I'm able to do, uh, viability, where's the best place to go. I thought lieutenant governor was a wonderful place. I don't think most people can say they didn't even know who the lieutenant governor is or that we have a lieutenant governor's office. And I think I can use that vehicle in a way that it hasn't been used before to really advocate on behalf of the public on issues that they don't hear being spoken about or they are being spoken about, but nothing's happening or it's not going far enough. So Kathy Hochul is the current lieutenant governor. 
uh, are you running against her, or are you running against Andrew Cuomo, who would be your, I guess, kind of boss if you were to win? Uh, well, thankfully, uh, no bosses, because they run independently. Uh, I am uh, running on the, uh, for the Democratic primary. Currently, uh, Kathy Hochul, I'm expecting, is going to be the person to uh, run again. It may not be. Uh, again, uh, most people don't know what the office does or who's in it. I really want to change it. Uh, I'm not going to be oppositional for oppositional sake, but we do have to have someone pushing uh, these agenda items, whether or not they are politically uh, expedient at that moment in time. Uh, what we've seen oftentimes are people uh, adjusting to the political winds. So we see people hold their finger up. It's blowing progressive now, so they put on a progressive coat. Uh, there are many of us who have been creating those wins for quite some time, and I want to make sure that representation is there. So it sounds like you're going to run. Uh, well, again, it was still in the, in the committee, uh, but it's been overwhelmingly positive this early. Uh, so it's looking good. But again, we want to make sure we're hearing from people across the state. We also want to make sure there is a good viability there, and it's looking good. I do want to mention it's important that we have diversity. If you look at the president, the vice president, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the state controller, uh, the state attorney general, there are two men preventing a black woman from running the state senate, the mayor, the speaker, the city controller. Uh, they don't have much diversity in it, and that's unfortunate. And so I think that's another piece that we want to make sure, it was something I brought up in the speaker's race, we want to make sure in the halls of government that they're representing the, the people who are there, uh, look like the people they're representing. Should Cuomo be reelected? I, I have said time and time again, I think he's earned himself a primary, and I really hope he gets it. Uh, you mentioned the race for speaker, and that has recently concluded. Um, Kathy Hochul got like 300,000 votes to become lieutenant governor last, last time. City council is much smaller. You were one of several candidates, but you were, you were unable to succeed in that race. It seems now like you're setting your sights on a much bigger target. Uh, where does the viability come from that you weren't able to get the speakership, but you're shooting for something that seems a lot bigger? Uh, it is a lot bigger. I'm very excited about this particular race. I knew going into the speaker's race, uh, my type of politics doesn't necessarily lend itself to there, but I thought it was important and my message was important, so I went for it. Uh, you have to get the vote of 50 of your colleagues who are also influenced by uh, outside influencers. So it's more of an establishment type inside ball game. I, it would be awesome if the speaker was elected in a general or primary election. It's not, so the messaging is different. You can't convey who you are. It's all about inside politics, baseball. Um, most people who know me know that that's not the best thing I am. I'm, I'm usually uh, not called an establishment uh, type of elected official, and so sometimes it's more difficult. Part of that uh, reputation you have is uh, a, a, a longstanding rumor or concern about your position on abortion, gay rights, gay marriage. If you Google Jumani Williams, that comes up fairly soon. I know you've talked about that a lot over the years. Is that a liability for a statewide race? Uh, well, they, they want it to be, but it's not because it's not true. And so one of the reasons I know I'm viable is that uh, just after I announced the committee, uh, Melissa De La Rosa, uh, on behalf of the government, immediately shot back with those issues. So I was like, okay, great. Um, this is a, a real possibility that they're seeing here that I can achieve something. Uh, but just for clarity, uh, and they know this, and we have people who are, uh, are going to be able to speak out on this, but this came up during the speaker's race. Sent out a memo to all of my colleagues just for clarity. Uh, I support uh, marriage equality, and I support a woman's right to access safe and legal abortions, and I will fight for both of those things. Uh, if Roe v. Wade is reversed, that's a danger to women. I want to make sure that there are protections in New York State. You are still a council member, for the, for the moment at least, for, from Brooklyn. Uh, the new term has just begun. What do you think it will be like in terms of the re relationship between the council and the mayor this time, and what are your own sort of personal goals legislatively for this term? Well, I'm very proud of last, uh, just last year, uh, City and State, which is a trade publication for City and State politics, uh, graded me uh, the second most productive council member in the city council right behind the speaker. Very proud of that, uh, the amount of bills we've passed, the effect we've had on the budget. Uh, I'm still a council member and will do that for, uh, make sure that I'm doing my job for as long as I'm a council member. We have an awesome staff. Uh, that are going to make sure uh, the needs are, are kept if I'm not, uh, the needs are being taken care of if I'm not there. My goals are still the same. The issues I care about are still the same. Uh, 
deeply affordable and income targeted housing, uh, dealing with gun violence, uh, making sure that uh, folks have access to jobs and health care and education. And what I found uh, in the issues in my district needed a citywide response, so I did that. What I'm finding is that the issues of the city oftentimes need a statewide response, and that in other places they're dealing with the same issues. And that's one of the reasons I'm exploring what I'm exploring. Giovanni Williams, would that all our guests generated so much news before coming on, <laughs> but thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. A year ago, New York's journalism world lost a true hero, the legendary investigative reporter and Brooklynite Wayne Barrett, who in the pages of The Village Voice, The Daily News, The Daily Beast, and his many books, spoke truth to power with nearly inhuman energy for nearly four decades, and who trained dozens of reporters still plying the trade in our city, including yours truly. Barrett's death on the eve of the inauguration of Donald Trump, who so often demonizes journalists, made it a doubly dark day. But it sounded an alarm for tough, smart reporters to step in and protect our democracy. Here to tell us about Barrett's work and legacy is Tom Robbins, a former colleague of Barrett's at The Voice and the investigative journalist in residence at CUNY's Graduate School of Journalism. Tom, welcome. Thanks for hey, being here. Hey, thank you. Anytime I get a chance to sing Wayne's praises. So sing some for folks who yeah. may not have benefited from his byline. What was, uh, what was Barrett about? You know, you mentioned all these other places he wrote for. He, he, he and you and me, we worked with him at the Village Voice. He was there for, I think, 30 years, and he he was a force of nature. You know, I mean, one of the, I think, amazing accolades at his funeral was when Chuck Schumer stood up and acknowledged to this church in Brownsville that I would not be standing here as a United States senator if not for the reporting of Wayne Barrett which is kind of an astonishing thing when I think back to when I was first getting to know Wayne Barrett. He was in the process of doing, digging up as much dirt as he could about Chuck Schumer, you know. But it says something about the kind of reporter he was. He was an equal opportunity attack dog, and he followed the story, and we miss him greatly. Uh, the only person who's benefited from it is the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe some others, too, in power. What about his approach? Like, the Barrett approach is something that some people have talked about, his, his approach to reporting. Um, what distinguished it from the typical person pounding the beat? I've never seen anyone like him. He would swallow the story whole. You know, he would order up from interns uh, copies of every single clip that had ever been written, and not online, but printed out so that he could read them. This was a man whose idea of a good time was to sit in a beach chair and read campaign finance filings. Uh, and he would make endless phone calls to every single source he could, taking notes uh, across the top of all the folders that he kept in a big pile on his desk in this wonderful cursive hand that he picked up in the Catholic schools that he attended in Lynchburg, Virginia, which is, believe it or not, where he started out. And, and Wayne really always focused on the sin, not the sinner. You know, he came really hard at his topics, but if fast forward, you know, somebody else was coming to him with a story, he didn't really care the fact that he had written something tough about them before. He would go right at that story. I noticed that a lot of, it struck me, a lot of people whom he's written tough stuff about were at his funeral, not just Schumer, but Governor Cuomo and others. Um, even though he went after them as hard as anybody had, something about him endeared him, even to people that he had kind of flayed publicly. What do you think it was? I think it was respect. After Wayne died, I saw this quote that he had given to somebody in the last year of his life when he was ailing from the lung ailment that ultimately killed him, saying that he doubted that there would be a single politician at his funeral rites. He was looking forward to it. And yet, you were there. I mean, the place Schumer was just one of them. You know, every major politician in the state practically was there to pay homage to a guy who they thought uh, was really, truly no fear or favor. And that they did, I think they respected the fact that he was dogged and that he was determined and that he would tell the story, flaws and all. So over, you mentioned 30 years of The Voice, obviously sometime after that too, who were some of his big targets? People oh. that he really managed to lay a few, a few good lefts and few. I mean, look, I mean, we, we should mention, you know, specifically he was the first reporter to spot Donald J. Trump 
as someone who deserved a really close-up investigative scrutiny. And he wrote his first story about Trump in 1979, about the deal that Trump was cutting at that point with his lawyer, Roy Cohen, to be able to take over this site adjacent to the Grand Central Terminal to build a brand new hotel there on the site of the old Commodore Hotel. And Wayne detailed back in that story about all the angles that Trump and Roy Cohen, his attorney, had played in order to get that deal and the massive tax subsidy that he somehow managed to shake down out of City Hall to help him build it and pay for it, a tax subsidy that continues to this day. So he was one of them. Al D'Amato. I mean, I think, I think Wayne thought of Al D'Amato, who, of course, the former U.S. senator, as somebody who really was a uh, almost everything that he did was worthy of close-up examination. And he wrote any number of stories about him. The, the one that Schumer credited for helping him get elected was the fact Wayne, in the middle of that 1998 election, managed to find the attendance records of Al D'Amato at the old Board of Supervisors uh, on Long Island, where he had been before he became senator, to show that he had missed 95 percent of the meetings there uh, while he was running for the Senate. At the same time, he was running ads on TV criticizing Schumer for having missed some votes in Congress. And Schumer grabbed that story, put it up in his own ad, right, in the, just like hours before the election. And Schumer credited that with making the difference. Also, Rudy Giuliani, a frequent target. Yeah, well, and... before he was a target, he was a hero. Right. I mean, you know, Wayne was a complicated guy. Uh, one of the great books I would commend to your listeners is City for Sale, the book that Wayne and Jack Newfield, uh, another great voice writer and, and great investigative journalist, did about the scandals of the last years of the Koch administration. And in that book, you, there is a hero, and his name is Rudy Giuliani. After Rudy Giuliani became mayor, Wayne lost patience with him fairly quickly and then wrote some of the most critical stories, ultimately writing a biography of Giuliani in which he revealed for the first time that Giuliani's family, including his father, had a lot of ties to organized crime. And his father, in fact, had served time in Sing Sing for a robbery, something which Giuliani claimed not to know. And in a subsequent book, he even had the temerity to question Giuliani's 9-11 uh, hero credentials, yeah. which, was, which was courageous. So talk so, about Wayne's legacy and the Wayne Barrett investigative fund that you and me and others are yeah. Yeah. trying to start up. What, what is that aiming to do? Well, when, when Wayne died, uh, his widow, Fran Barrett, uh, and his son, Mac Barrett, uh, wanted very much to make sure that Wayne's work continued and that this flame that he had kindled in so many people, you, me, scores of others, got a chance to continue to flourish. And so uh, the idea was that we would create a fund to give money to journalists to be able to do really good, deep digging stories uh, about issues like the kind that Wayne did, excuse me, with a focus on both New York City and New York, as well as the Trump administration. And it's housed at the Nation Institute, and we're—I forget how much money we raised, but it was enough to get going, so that uh, there's uh, a number of stories that have already been green-lighted and are in the works, and we're looking for more. If Wayne were alive today, looking at the Trump administration, what do you think he'd be working on? What kind of stories yeah, do you think he'd be doing? A dozen stories. I think Wayne would be ahead of the pack on a bunch of them. You know, it's, it's funny to realize that some of the things that Wayne was talking about in the last months before his death are things that I sort of looked at askance because I thought, well, you know, there's Wayne chasing down a rabbit hole that's probably not going anyplace. But in fact, he was the first person to talk to me about Russian collusion. You know, he was the first person to raise with me that he thought that that was a serious issue. Uh, he recognized, I think, that Trump's reliance on foreign banks and on the purchasers of his condominiums and his hotels and his buildings was a real soft spot that deserved probing. Uh, story today by McClatchy about the fact that Russian money supposedly went to help the National Rifle Association in putting ads into the campaign. That's the kind of thing that Wayne was poking around at back there. So uh, I have a little bit of time left. In the past few months, there have been some changes in the local journalism marketplace, DNA Info closing, a lot of concern about the state of local journalism. Mm -hmm. You've been in that field for, for, some, for some time. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the state of it? It's lousy. <laughs> it's terrible. I mean, look, you know, the fact is we are doing a pretty good job. We, as an industry of 
reporters who like to dig. I think we're doing a pretty good job on Trump, and we're doing a pretty good job keeping track of most of what's going on in Washington. You can't say the same thing for major urban centers. Uh, you know, there still are lots of people pioneering on. City limits is probably the best shining example here locally, but almost all of the big publications have pulled back. You know, I mean, they've been caught in this, you know, visor grip between lack of ads and falling readership, and they have gone to where they think the market is, and that's clearly not, in their eyes, local journalism. So it's one of the reasons that we have not-for-profit organizations like ProPublica, like the Marshall Project, which I've done some writing for after the last couple of years, pumping dollars from outside the mainstream of readership into trying to get stories done. And I, I guess that's where the future is. You know, I'm not sure exactly what other path there is to making sure that these stories get covered. Uh, I'm, um, I'm astonished at how little investigation that there is of just daily goings on. We live in a city which has a budget of $85 billion. We live Speaking in a city that, where they spend $100 million a year on lobbyists to try to figure out a way to get a piece of that money. Speaking of money, if people want to support the fund, nationinstitute.org is, is where you go to do that? Uh, I think it's the nationinstitute.org. Okay. Right? Tom Robbins, thank you for coming on to talk about our friend and hero, and I'm sorry you forgot your tie. <laughs> but thanks for joining us. So, football fans know we're drawing close to the three most colossally important games of the year, the conference championships coming up this Sunday and the Super Bowl on February 4th. But our local franchises, the Jets and Giants, stop playing meaningful games sometime around Halloween. For them, the sooner this season officially ends, the better. But is there any way Jets and Giants fans can survive and enjoy the final three weeks of the NFL season? Here are five coping tips for your playbook. Tactic one. Root against Tom Brady. Now, I was born in Boston and reared elsewhere in New England, so my loyalty is always with the Patriots. But I have sensed that not everyone loves TB12 as much as I do. So why not own the hate and simply root for someone, say a Jacksonville Jaguars defensive end or a sudden bout of old age, to stop him? Tactic two, root for Tom Brady. Hey, if you can't beat him, join him. Wouldn't it be cool to say you watched the greatest quarterback of all time win his sixth title at age 40? I think so. Remember, the bigger Brady's stature, the more valuable are those times when the Jets and Giants manage to get between touchdown Tommy and victory. Tactic three, play find the politics. When a number of NFL players took a knee this season to protest racial injustice, some critics faulted them for injecting politics into the game. A weird thing to say, since the NFL has been a potent cocktail of patriotism and militarism for years. You could keep score at home of how many subtle or not-so-subtle political messages are transmitted between the whistles. Tactic four, watch the other football. That's right, soccer. You know what's great about soccer? Moving on. Tactic five, get pumped for the Winter Olympics. If you really can't get into the games this weekend, you could start getting ready for the Winter Games, that delightful two-week period every four years when everyone pretends to know the difference between a triple axle and a quadruple Lutz. You could study up, become a luge expert, work up some funny jokes about the biathlon, not that there's anything funny about cross-country skiing while shooting a rifle. You could watch old curling matches and try not to get addicted, seriously. Whatever you do, however you cope, enjoy the games and the off-season. It's only 230 days until the first game of the 2018-2019 NFL calendar, but who's counting? Thanks for joining us today. Ashley will be back next week in the afterglow of this weekend's Women's March to talk about getting more women elected to office. She'll also talk about police reform, the media and criminal justice, and New York's first breast milk bank. You have all weekend to think about that. Mm -hmm.